also on the diagram that there are two uh, mountains or two mountain ranges, Schlieve Foy to the right and Schlieve Gullion to the left. And uh, Ravensdale is a strategic gap or a strategic fault line between these two elevated areas. And it's not surprising that this fault line or this gap became an important routeway throughout the centuries. You'll also notice to the south of Ravensdale, at the bottom of the box, there is Dundalk, which is a very important town for Ravensdale. And towards the end of the box, there's Bally Muscanlan. And that's an important part because this area is known or is in the parish of Bally Muscanlan. Now, the next slide. Uh, unfortunately, Linda, the, the, the box here, maybe if I can pull the box over, it will. It will, yeah, I'll pull the box over. That's bad at the box, right. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, uh, Dundalk and Uri are uh, in a gap or in a fault line. And this fault line is known as the Gap of the North. And the Gap of the North was caused in many ways by geographical features like drumlins. These are islands surrounded by water and also by hills, which you can see in the bottom here. And it was much easier to move around in those times by going the elevated route. But the elevated route meant that you really were traveling in single file and you weren't carrying any heavy merchandise. So essentially any travel that took place during those times was any light travel was on elevated ground. And this area, the gap of the North while it was important, was also very forested and very hard to maneuver. Now, you will see here on the right hand side, you will see. Which was split open by volcanoes about 60 years ago. And there's a whole series of dikes here, which I am, are fault lines, which I'm pointing out. But the important ones for us, easily the most important is Ravensdale. But another important one is the one that goes to the west of Ravensdale, the Jonesboro Dyke. Now, on the left hand side, you will see here that this, once again, where I'm pointing is the gap of the north. This is a map uh, of the me medieval times going back to the 14th, 15th, 16th century. And these are all the, uh, the Gaelic tribes who uh, were the leaders, were the chiefs in uh, Ulster for hundreds and hundreds of years. And there's one very close here to the, to the, you can see the two red balls here. You have the green ball, which is the English, and the, uh, sorry, the green ball, which is the Irish, and the red ball, which is the English. And right beside those, you have the O'Hanlons, and they were, they were an Irish clan, and they caused a lot of trouble for the English. Now, it's not surprising then that the Gap of the North became uh, it's famed in, in story and in history, and the story of Cook Holland. It did, just didn't arrive yesterday or the day before that. The story of Cook Holland recalls the many, many activities, the many, many encounters that took place during the Gap of the North. And this has all been now recorded in the famous epic poem, the Thorn Bolt Coolinia. This is Cucullin here, and he was some man, you wouldn't want to meet him on a dark night. And on the right hand side, you have Roach Castle. And Roach Castle was a castle, well, it, this is a sign that this area was being fought over between the English and the Irish, for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is, this is the gap of the North. This is the interface between the English and the Irish since the arrival of the Anglo-Normans in 1169. Now, uh, I, uh, there are centuries and hundreds and hundreds of years uh, there were battles going on, so much so that we, a lot of people didn't know and it wasn't sure where the line was between the North and the South between the Gales and the Pale. And this particular map here is from around about 1598, 1599, 
And the way we know it, its date is, you can see here just on the left, the Earl of Essex. He was the leader of the English forces in 1599. And it says here, part of the county of Louth being part of the province of Leinster. This is the, this is the extract here. So this part of County Loud was in the county of Leinster, but this part of Loud just up here, see, see where my arrow is? Just north of Ballymascanlan, all of Cooley area here was no man's land. It really wasn't, a, it's officially up here in the county of Down, but it was no man's land. And this also is the central theme of our beginning of our story. This was no man's land. What I mean by that is whoever was able to conquer it was it had the use of it. And that was the reason why the cast, so many castles were built along here, because that was an attempt by the Anglo-Normans to control it. But there were also castles by the Anglo-Irish. Glass Drummond Castle was up here. Dungooley Castle to the north was also, and that was an area that was controlled by the Gaels. Now, uh, I just mentioned about the Earl of Essex. He was the leader of the uh, English forces in 1599. He made an unholy mess of his job, so he was replaced by a fellow called Lord Lord Mountjoy. Now I have four I have four um, motifs up here, or four dates up here. I'm not going to bore you with dates, but one one I just would important is important to point out is the Ulster Plantation. Ulster Plantation meant obviously that the um, the people. Uh, I hope I don't have to go through the Battle of Kinsale and the Flight of the Elves. I hope people know about that. Um, the Ulster Plantation, from our point of view, was important because it saw a complete reversal of the land ownership in Ulster. And the Ulster Plantation was financed by the City of London, the London Dairy Companies. London Dairy, we all know where London Dairy is. The London Dairy Companies financed uh, Queen Elizabeth. In her, in her plantation plans and also in her fights with Hugh O'Neill. And they wanted their money back, so they got loads and loads of land in Ulster. But they handed, they didn't stay, they didn't live in Ulster, the English, the English uh, adventurers. They brought over the Scots people. And thousands and thousands of Scots came over in 1600, when well, they came over in 1610, 1611, 1612, and they settled in Ulster. And that will be an important part of our story as we go along, the settlement of the Scots. And the Scots were Scots Presbyterians. It's important to remember that in the 16th century, Scotland became Protestant. Not only did they become Protestant, but Presbyterians. And Presbyterians are a very strict form of Protestantism. And they were, the Presbyterians were regarded as suspect by the uh, English because, uh, by the English church anyway, because the Presbyterians didn't accept the king as the head of the church. And that caused a lot of problems later on. I will see those in a few minutes. Now, I, well, the first slide I showed you there was the Moiry Castle. This is the Moiry Castle that was built here in 1601 by Mountjoy. It was the beginning of the end of the O'Neill uh, rule in Ulster, but this particular slide is taken from Kilnasogart. Some of you will know, most of you will know where Kilnasogart is. It's a, it was, there was a monastery here uh, in, uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the famous old stones that are in Kilnasogart today are witness to that, those famous times. But Mount Joy saw a great opportunity here. He said, I have a monastery here and I want to build a castle over there. So he brought all the stones over there, and Moiry Castle that we know today is built from the stones of the monastery of, um, of Kilnasogart. Now over here on the right-hand side, you have another interesting map, and this is a map that was drawn up in 1609 when the plantation of Ulster was being found. And I said to you that this was no man's land, but when they, when they started uh, to, to map out Ulster, they started putting in places like Dulagi, Polik, Annaverna, Anaskea, Feed, Dramad, Karikanina. Those are all townlands in Louth. But now that the English had taken over, this, they had won the war, 
they started, they grabbed everything. So they thought Oriel was part of, or better let's go back to that, Oriel was part of Ulster. Well, I suppose, strictly speaking, it was if the, if the Irish ruled it, but now that the English ruled it, they wanted it. So I, so I just thought it was interesting. You have the Moira Castle here, that you see on the left-hand side, that's in the townland of Carrick Brawl, that's in Ulster, but the rest of these townlands are in Leinster. So it was, it was, this was not, again, a sign of no man's land. Now onto this diagram here. This is a famous map. It's a map by a chap called Richard Bartlett. He drew the map in 1602. And this is, this is, uh, uh, this is the, um, this is Dundalk down here in the bottom left-hand corner of your, of your map. And this is what they call the Schlemai Lucre. This was the way across the, the plain of the way between Dundalk and Newry. And it passed, it passed through the Mahari. I don't know whether you can see that up here. M-A-C-H-A-R-A-G-H-E-R-I-E, -E, the Mahari. The Mahari is the Irish for a plain. And when um, Mount Joy was building his castle way down here in Moiri, he called it the Moiri Castle because it gave access to the Moiri and the plain. And this the plain was very important because this was lowland. This is where the armies could move. This was where the modern armies could, could move in their heavy artillery, could move in their wagons that were impossible to move over the upland area. Over here, you have the O'Hanlons looking down on. This is the same map here on the right-hand side in, in slightly more detail. And this is the Valley of Ravensdale here. It wasn't called Ravensdale just yet. This is the Flory River that powers the mills. This is Ballymuscanlan here, the castle of Ballymuscanlan. This was Fahert. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, the castle of Ballymuscanlan was really the border between Ulster and the Pale. And Fahert was also part of Leinster, was also part of, um, of the, of, uh, or on the, on the borderline. Now, but uh, it, it was important, I'm getting confused here with this. Yeah, okay, I would, would, yeah, I'll stay with this now, okay. And, but now to, to carry, to get across the, um, to get across the Mahari, they had to, um, the, the Mahari was full of swamps, it was full of trees, and it was very difficult to navigate. So they had to build causeways or causes, as you saw, as, as I didn't point out on the map, and these up here, Causeway Ator is a bridge of wood or stone across a river or bog. And these are examples of causeways that are built on the road uh, just north of Dundalk. And this is a tower. This is an artificial road um, through the bogs and swamps. But in those days, the bogs and swamps were not as open ended as this. It was full of trees like this, and it was very dangerous to travel through. Now, again, we're moving on very quickly. 1641 rebellion, 1660 restoration. Very important as well for our purposes because an awful lot of more Scots came in in 1660 because the restoration meant there was a new, uh, a new king, a lot of the land, uh, the new king had a lot of lands to give out and again, he gave it to the Scots. Now we're onto the 1688 glorious revolution. Some people might call it Glorious Revolution. I just thought it was a nice name for it. But the, allied to that and very close to that is 1694, Malcolm McNeil and Blaney Townley. And they are important people in our story. Now, the, 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 uh, the landlords, the main landlords in Ballymuscanlan were the Moors, the Moors of Mellifont. This is... Uh, uh, an interesting diagram drawn by the OPW, and it, it shows more, it shows Mellifont, but it really shows Mellifont that the Moors made out of the stones of the monastery, the famous monastery in Mellifont. And the Moors were landlords, the Moors were important landlords, but really they, they, they had an awful lot of land around the country. They were very important in the government. They built, um, they built Dublin, 
you've all heard of Moore Street in Dublin, and the Moore, the, the, the Moore, I'll call it Moore Street, and they call, you'll have heard of Abbey Street, and you'll have heard of, you'll have heard of Henry Street and Earl Street. These were all put up by Henry, Earl of Drogheda. And O'Connell Street was once called Drogheda Street. And the Gresham Hotel that you all go for your cups of coffee every now and again was the home of the Moors in Drogheda. But the Moors were too busy down in Dublin and all over the place. They got loads, grabbed up loads and loads of land. They didn't have too much time to spend uh, in, uh, in Valley of Scanlon. So uh, in, in, in 1694, they decided that they were going to lease out Valley of Scanlon to um, Malcolm McNeil and to Blaney Town. Now, uh, Valley of Scanlon is, is, a, is a townland, is, is a district here. And, Ravens, and this, these are the areas that we are most concerned with. This is the area that um, the Moors gave to, um, to MacNeil, but the Moors also gave Jenkins Town to, um, the, um, uh, to Blaney Townland. And Blaney, this is a, a, all of the land that Moors had in Ballymascanlan. This is the portion that um, uh, Blaney had in, uh, in Jenkins Town, and Blaney built a nice house for himself, which is now a ruin called Piedmont House. You might ask the question, why did he give, why did Moore give um, uh, the, the, why did he, why did he, he divide the townland? What, what was the, what was the story here? The reason he divides the townland, uh, the reason he devised the, or uh, divided the, the, um, uh, the um, parish, Valley Mascanlan, was because, as I said, the Presbyterians were suspect because Malcolm McNeil was one of those Scots Presbyterians that I talked about earlier. Now, uh, Malcolm McNeil uh, uh, was an officer in King William's army, and he was he had he had proved his worth, so to speak. But the Moors weren't so sure, and they brought in Blaney Townley to keep an eye on McNeil, so to speak. Uh, McNeil settled in Ballymascanlan and Ravensdale, and Blaney settled in Jenkinstown. Now, Blaney was Church of Ireland, so he was a true blue. Malcolm wasn't Church of Ireland. Malcolm was Presbyterian, but Malcolm proved to be very important to the, um, uh, to the authorities. The Fiñart Gaelga, Malcolm McNeil, August of Clan, August Vise and all Vise Alberta, Gulga a Lourdes, August Lourdes less a grow than a scamper, August Oilamark killed the beer shoe. For those of you in Tacoma or San Jose, that's the Gaelic language. That's the language we used to speak in this country. But for some reason, we don't speak it anymore, even though we could speak it if we really wanted to, because most of us spend 15 years in school learning it. But we're a queer crowd in Ireland, and sometimes we do things that don't make a whole lot of sense. Anyway, we'll move on. As I said, Malcolm was very uh, important to the local people. I told you that this area was a very troubled area, that there was, it was no man's land. And after the Battle of the Boyne, after the Glorious Revolution, a lot of Irish people, a lot of the native people were very cross because they had lost so much of their land. And a lot of them started to work against the government and these people became known as Tories, Tories. Now, Malcolm McLean proved to be very important to the authorities because he was a great Tory hunter. As I said in the Irish, he was able to understand what was going on he was able to talk with the ordinary people and he was able to find out who was hiding where and what was going on. And this is a particular piece from uh, the grand jury records of 1717 that Malcolm McNeil was paid £25 for, for apprehending Lachlan McCrory and Sylvester McMahon, two proclaimed Tories. These aren't the only Tories that he... Uh, he um, uh, he, he captured he captured many many Tories, 
and, and to get £25 for doing this little job of work would have turned out to be a very uh, profitable exercise for McNeil. Now, that wasn't the only thing that McNeil did. Once, once he managed uh, to um, quieten the area and to get rid of Tories, and he wasn't the only one to get rid of the Tories, but he was one of the leading lights, he got very involved <clears throat> in the local grand jury. Now, there's an interesting story here because as a Presbyterian, he was forbidden to take uh, any uh, administrative duties. He was forbidden to have a job with the government or the grand jury. And in the north of Ireland, all of the Presbyterians were refused permission to attend and to work on the grand jury. But MacNeil had proved to be such an important man for the grand jury that he was also allowed to stay on the grand jury and he, spent a lot of his time improving the roads and the infrastructure and building bridges and crossing all the causeways and the bogs and improving the communications in this area. So he was regarded as a very important man. He was also a very, once, once, uh, he, once peace had been restored, he was also a very patient man and also a very tolerant man and he was very tolerant towards the Catholics because just as the Catholics were penalized in the penal laws, so were the Presbyterians. And as a result of this, the Catholics were able to practice their religion uh, openly in Ballymascanlan. And the Archbishop of Armagh, who was officially in hiding and officially could have, been, uh, could have lost his head if the authorities had found him, uh, he lived in Ballymascanlan for years and years. And some of the local uh, uh, True Blues reported this fact to Dublin Castle uh, that the Archbishop was hiding and that the priests were coming and going all the time to visit him. The Dublin Castle decided uh, discretion was the better part of valor and they did nothing about it. So that Ma Malcolm McNeil was able to carry on. Malcolm McNeil was also uh, a great, uh, he was a Gaelic speaker, as I already said, and he was a great uh, a proponent of the arts, and he was a great supporter of Thurlock O'Carrollan. And you probably know that Thurlock O'Carrollan was one of the greatest musicians, perhaps the greatest musician that we, that we uh, had from the Gaelic times. And, um, and uh, Malcolm McNeil's daughter, Betty, was one of the few Anglo-Irish, one of the few uh, 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 gentry, if you like, of, um, of this time to have a, a song composed for her by O'Carroll. Now, um, Malcolm McNeil uh, died eventually in 1730, and uh, he, he was replaced. He had two sons. Malcolm was one, and Daniel was the other. We'll come to Daniel a little bit later on. But Malcolm uh, did, did an important thing for our purposes. He started building mills. He built three mills on the Flory Valley, one in Dramad, Molliard, a corn and tuck mill, one in Ballynaminan, corn and tuck mill, and one in Bally, Muscannon. Now, you all know what a corn mill is, but a tuck mill is a mill for fulling wool. It's a mill for tightening wool it's a mill for making wool more pliable and also for making it more adaptable for use in clothes. It's a very, it was a very important um, part of agricultural life. But these two activities, corn and tuck mills, were essentially agricultural activities. Now I just, I have in red here, as you can see, Malliard. Malliard was the name of the area that we now know today as uh, Ravensdale. And uh, we'll be coming back to that in a few minutes. The second section here is an interesting one, insofar as Malcolm McNeil said <clears throat> that the tenants of the townlands of the town, uh, tenants of the townlands of Clog, Killen, Clanchigori, Eden Tubber, Caricana, Naliard, Dramad, and Feed were obliged by their leases to grind their corn and thicken their wool at the mill. In other words, these were all part and parcel of the tenants' duties. And if they failed to do that, he gave them, he gave them a tough time. 
They had to, if they failed to attend the mill with their corn and their wool, they had to pay two weathers yearly, 10 shillings in lieu, eight loads of turf drawn to the dwelling house of Malcolm McNeil, or a, a penny in lieu of each load, and two pullets out of every house inhabited, or 60 in lieu. This was a standard procedure in those days. If you were a tenant, you were tied by your landlord, and the leases were very, very strict. Now, we're coming on to the Fortescues. The Fortescues, the, the Moors, as I said, were great landlords, but the Moors uh, were a bit like many families. One generation makes it, one generation holds it, and the next generation, well, you know what they do. Well, that's happened, that happened, that Henry Moore, the fourth Earl of Drogheda, he became the Earl at a very young age. He married very young. He, he lived a high life. And he ended up before the age of 30 with debts of over 200,000 pounds. So he had to be, he had to be, um, uh, land had to be sold. And one of the land, parts of one of them, some of the land that was sold was Ballymascanlan. And Thomas Fortescue bought Ballymascanlan from the receiver of the estate of Henry Moore. That was in 17, that was about 1731. It came through in 1735 and Thomas Fortescue. And Thomas Fortescue had two sons. One was William Charles. This is the guy over here. We won't talk too much about him. But the other fellow was the chap who's really interesting for us is Thomas James Fortescue. Now, James Fortescue uh, was, a, was a, a good, he was one of the good guys. And he was critical of the policy whereby our Roman Catholics are precluded from taking leases for lives, because happy as the man who was certain of his joying his farm during his life would exert himself to approve the adornment. But the wretched tenant who knows not the hour he is to be turned out of his house will not approve for fear of making it more valuable to some new possessor. possessor. The Irishman, he concludes, whether he prays to his creator in English or in Latin, will prove a much better citizen when he feels he has a vested interest in the system to the ownership of land. James Fortescue was willing to grant loyal Roman Catholics the right to carry arms, and he openly expressed his joy in Parliament at the news of the relaxation of both kingdoms of the Test Act for Presbyterians in 1780. Right. <clears throat> now, so uh, Thomas Fortescue, the Fortescues started improving things, but we have to go back a little bit. After, after the Battle of the Boyne, it, uh, the new uh, William Bywin administration started building roads. And one of the first roads they built between Dublin, between Newry and Dundalk was the Jonesboro Road. This is the straight uh, as a gun barrel road that you can see here in the center of, the, of the, the diagrams. And that was built in 1710. And that became a turnpike road in 1731. And that was meant to be the main road between Dublin and Belfast, between Newry and, um, and uh, Dundalk. And this, <clears throat> and this map here in blue points out to you the straight road, straight as a gun barrel, as I said, uh, between D D Jonesboro and Dundalk. And just interesting here, on the left-hand side, slightly off the point, you have White Mills here. White Mills is the name of the townland. It used to be called Ballynaminen, but it's now called White Mills because um, uh, uh, one of the McNeils built a mill here. It wasn't a, a corn mill, uh, or a, it was a wind mill, and it had a big sail on it, and it became known as the, if you bring your corn to the White Mill, and this was the stump of the White Mill that is now one of the townlands in Ballymoscander. This, this is one of the very few examples of where the Irish name for the townland was changed um, to an English name in the same way as uh, Ravensdale Park became the English name for the Irish name Mullia. Now, the Linen Hall, very important. <clears throat> the Linen Hall was set up um, by the Linen Board. The Linen Board was founded in Dublin in 1711. 
the government in Dublin and the government in London wanted to support linen because they wanted the new, uh, the new uh, settlement in Ireland to be a peaceful one. They wanted commerce to thrive and survive because remember, Ireland had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of war. And one way they helped to set up the linen industry is they invited Huguenots to come and set up the linen industry. And this chap here, Rui, Ru, uh, Louis Cromelin, he was a Protestant, who, a Huguenot, who was expelled by Louis XIV. He, he wrote a book about explaining how the linen industry could be worked on a commercial basis. And that was very successful. And the Irish Linen Center in Lisbon Museum today is a wonderful place to visit, and it tells you an awful lot more about the linen industry. <clears throat> now, James Hamilton was an important man. He was Lord Clanbrassel. You all know where Clanbrassel Street is in Dundalk, or most of you do anyway. And, and he was a relation of Thomas Fortescue. In fact, he was a brother-in-law <clears throat> of Thomas Fortescue. <clears throat> And so they've got on well together. They were both MPs for Dundalk at the same time. And James Hamilton set up a linen industry in Dundalk in, in a place called Parliament Square, which is now the military barracks in Dundalk. And that, by this big building, was built in the first place in the 1730s. And Thomas Fortescue learned a lot from this. And he decided that he would get involved in the linen industry. And this is the, the linen hall in Dundalk. And that's the junction of the Bridge Street and Linen Hall Street. And you might wonder why Linen Hall Street is so called. Well, now you know. Now, Ravensdale, as I said, Fortescue's wanted to build up, wanted to improve the area. And they decided that they were going to live in Ravensdale. And by 1765, Ravensdale became part of the Linen Triangle. This is the Linen Triangle here that stretches from Belfast to Dungannon to Newry. But Ravensdale was right on the edge of uh, Newry, and it really was part of the uh, Linen Triangle. And this is Ravensdale here, Dublin and Belfast. And these are the areas for the, the markets uh, where uh, the, the buyers from Ravensdale used to go and buy the unbleached linen or the brown linen Coot Hill, Clonus, Loch Gaul, and Armagh. And this is an example of one of the uh, linen uh, weavers uh, showing, his, showing his wares and hoping that somebody will buy it at one of the fairs. <clears throat> now, flax seed is very important. I, I have written out here, flag, farmers in Ireland harvested their flax while the seeds were green to produce a softer fibre for spinning it in yarn. However, Harvesting before the plant fully ripens prevents seeds from being mature enough to plant for next year's crop. So the important seed from the colonial North America. Now, as a, as a result of all of this, the, the, you, you will remember that I told you that a lot of the, the people who came over to Ireland in the, in the, after the Ulster plantation, they um, got land. They got land for about for three live leases for three lives, but by the by the 1680s those leases were up. The landlords then put up the rents, and an awful lot of those Presbyterians left Ireland and went over to their Presbyterian cousins in America, who had gone out on the Mayflower, if you might remember, in around about 1610. This started the beginning of a flaxseed uh, industry whereby the linen industry in Ravensdale got their flax seed from North America and the flax seed ships came over to Ireland and arrived every March with loads and loads of flax seed so that the, the new seed could be sown again and start the whole thing all over again. And this is an example of a flax seed ship in Merchants Key and Newry. Uh, the Newry Canal was opened up in 1742, and this was all connected with the flaxseed industry. 
and for, Fortescue was very interested in all of this. And he, he thought that if um, you improve the canal and built, uh, built the canal farther down, uh, that you could get these flax seed, flax seed ships up into the center of Newry, it would be a good idea. So he got the, he, he helped to build this Fortescue Lock, and it was called Fortescue Lock for years and years after that. Now, this is a, a, a print of the Ravensdale area. It's one of the very few prints uh, of uh, anywhere in the 18th uh, century. And, and, and it's a stop by William Higgs. And that's an example of how, uh, how important the linen industry was in, uh, in Ravensdale. And this chap here was pulling the flax seed out of a retting dam. It's the, the flax is put into the retting dam to soften it up. Then it's brought over here and it's, it's beetled, if you like, by, to, to soften it up even further. And be, then it's brought over here to a fire and it's dried, or it could also be brought out here up to spread out over the green and also dyed, dried. Or over here, this is an example of the spinning of the linen. You have the spinning of the linen going on here. Unfortunately, uh, we can't see it uh, as accurately as we possibly could. There's the spinning of the, of, of the linen going on here. And these pictures were shown to illustrate the basic essentials of what was the domestic in linen industry in Ravensdale. Now, um, this is a, an extract from Arthur Young. Arthur Young was the most famous uh, uh, agriculturalist of the day. He visited Ireland a few times. And one time uh, he, came, he came to Ravensdale. He, um, he, he, uh, he sent a note to James Fortescue that he would be coming uh, to his place in the next couple of weeks. But unfortunately, for some reason or other, Fortescue wasn't at home when he arrived. <clears throat> but that didn't, <clears throat> that didn't stop him giving a good account of his time. I saw many good stone and state houses, some bleach greens, and I was much pleased to see the enclosures creeping up the sides of the mountains. Mr. Fortescue's situation is very romantic, fine woods hanging at every side, the lawn beautifully scattered with trees spreading into them, and a pretty river winding through the valley, beautiful in itself, but trebly so on information that before he fixed there, it was all a wild waste. So um, this is a, a picture here of the population density. This is the road that Young was talking about. This is the road up to Annaverna, the road up to Annaverna. Those of you will know that this is up towards where the Pop Father is held. And these are the, this is where the, the Irish um, were, uh, if you like, confined to. An example here, Lachlan and Parsons has got a yearly lease. These are all for linen workers on 1807 and 42 acres in the mountains of Annaverna, for which they paid a rental of 45 pounds. <clears throat> Thomas Lloyd, agent of Lord Claremont, let them make a, their own arrangement for about subdivision. So the importance about this particular diagram here is that it shows how densely population this area became. In many ways, this was one of the most densely populated areas in the entire country. And it's an interesting comparison or contrast <clears throat> between areas down here around RD, Drabiskin and Midloud, which have extremely good land, but very few people living in. Because uh, these are all used for tillage. It was a strange thing that the poorer the land was, the more people were on it. And the better the land was, the fewer people were on it. <clears throat> now we come to Ravensdale. What does Ravensdale mean? As I said, the old name was Molliard. Why did the Fortescues choose Ravensdale? Well, I don't know. Um, the, the, uh, there was a tradition uh, that uh, they, if, if, if you were a Norman uh, family, and you had an unbroken line of descent from um, the Battle of Hastings, uh, you, had, you were entitled to put a raven on your heraldic shield. 
and the Fortescues were one of those families. So perhaps this is the reason they're called the Ravensdale on the basis <clears throat> that the anglo Normans had remained, had, had become very successful and become one of the powers of the land in England uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years, that the same was going to happen in Ireland. <clears throat> on the other hand, the raven is often regarded as, with a certain amount of superstition and a certain amount of, uh, of mystery. And when Charles II came back from exile uh, in 1660, uh, he, um, uh, he, he wanted to make a few changes. And uh, when uh, he arrived back in London, the astronomers who were in the Tower of London decided they wanted uh, the ravens uh, out of there because they were causing a lot of trouble with the, with the astronomers' views of the sky. And, uh, and they persuaded Charles to, um, to, to uh, get rid of the ravens. But just before he did that, somebody told him that there was a tradition that if the ravens, if the ravens, um, uh, if the ravens uh, were removed, that so would the king. So Charles, who had just come back from journeying around in exile for 20 years, decided that uh, he, he would change his mind. So he, he left the Ravens in the Tower of London and he moved the astronomers down to Greenwich, where they are still to this day. Also, <clears throat> the Raven, as you probably know, uh, has a, is associated with um, with carrion or with associated with death and loss. And, um, and a lot of you will be familiar with the statue of Sam Shepherd in the GPO in Dublin, when the dying Ku Cullen, uh, the, the only way the, the uh, Maves uh, um, uh, army knew that Ku Cullen was dead was because the raven alighted on, on his shoulder, as you can see here. So perhaps we just don't know Maybe somebody might have some better idea of why Ravensdale was so called, and maybe we can have a chat about that afterwards. <clears throat> now, the first mention of Ravensdale was in 1760, 1761, in the reports and observations of, Sir, of Robert Stevenson. And he was the chief reporter for, to the trustees of the Linen Board. <clears throat> and he, he reported in 1760, that you have bleach grains by all vessels, Ogles and Barrett at Ravensdale. Bingo! We have the first mention of Ravensdale. <clears throat> then we notice in 1761, there's a list of trouble, so there's, uh, there's more people coming. Then we have a fourth bleach green in 72. And then in 73, we have the Ogles, the Tribbles, the Davis, and Mr. Thompson. And their um, uh, tribbles are in Malliard. So we have still have Malliard. So 1761, the first mention of Ravensdale. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting map. Um, this is John Rock's map of County Armagh in 1760. You might say, well, why is Armagh? What have, what have we got to do with Armagh here in Ravensdale? But first of all, point out Ravensdale Park. Again, the first time we see Ravensdale on a map. Secondly, you have the Dublin Road. This is the Dublin Road here. Remember I talked about the Turnpike Road going to Jonesburg. This was the Dublin Road. <clears throat> Secondly, you have the Turnpike Gate. Can you see the Turnpike Gate here? Now, that's an important one to remember. The Turnpike Gate is in Jonesboro, not anywhere else. You'll notice also there's a barracks here. Remember I told you that they, this was a very troubled area. Lots of, lots of Tories, lots of, lots of people who were again the government, so to speak. So there was a barracks needed at Jonesboro. And also we have Moiry, Moiry Castle that we talked about earlier on. <clears throat> but another important road too is this road here, the road from Dundalk. This road here goes to what we now know today as Ravensdale Park. This was the, um, uh, the, the, the main road to Ravensdale Park, to the to Newry, but it was growing right beside the landlord's house. And landlords don't usually don't like people looking in the window. 
<clears throat> and seeing what you're at. So we'll see that that road didn't last there forever. This is the county bridge here, the county bridge, which is the county bridge between County Armagh and County, <clears throat> county Loud. And this is Jonesboro River. It's called Jonesboro River here, but it's really the Flurry River. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. Now, Matthew Wren came along in 1766. This is six years later, and we see there are big changes. This is the road from Dundalk that we talked about going through Ravensdale Park. Well, that's no longer being used. That now has been cut off by, um, by uh, uh, the, the Fortescue's. The road now, the new road now is the road that goes at the Black Gate down to the Curlew Bridge and on here under Feed Mountain into the Flurry Bridge. But you'll also notice, unfortunately, it's not as clear on this map. We'll see it in a minute. You hit, the Turnpike Road has now been changed. The Turnpike Road is now down at the County Bridge. Okay, now we'll move on. And um, I mentioned about the McNeils building a lot of roads. Uh, they built a lot of roads, surely. And, 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 and Thomas Fortescue and James Fortescue also built a lot of roads, but they built the roads to gravitate towards Ravensdale. And this is the, this is a, the main road from Newry to, uh, Raven, Newry to Dundalk, went by this uh, lime kiln here. This milestone 43 is still on the road, if you get out of your car and have a look at it. And this is the roads that McNeil and Fortescue built. And they wanted to build, a, they wanted to draw the traffic away from Jonesboro towards Ravensdale. There were, lime kiln was very important in this area as well. And a great deal of people came to this area to build or to get the lime, to bring the limestone back to fertilize their soil. These are a number, this is the Polyk Acres lime kiln, and this is the Mount Pleasant lime kiln. And this is the area of lime all along here in south of um, Valley of Scanlon, the southern part of the Cooley Peninsula. And all the farmers who used to who worked in South Down and South Armagh used to come down here for their lime. And that was important to have good roads for them as the Fortescue's wanted them to go through their territory. <clears throat> now, if Fortescue wanted to set up a lime, uh, a, a mill, he had to organize things. He had to channel the water from the river. <clears throat> he had to dig bleach. He had to dig mill races, mill races, and he had to channel the water to the factories that he was building. And this is this is fairly basic stuff. But you take you take a weir or you take a, a dam off off or or take a, a a race off the river. You build your mill down here. You build your wheel. You build your sluice over the wheel. And the wheel then is turned and it generates the power. And here you have, here you have, and once you have the wheel turning, you can have six different leads off it, maybe 12 different leads off it. And you can have, and this in this diagram here, you can have three floors of mills working, three floors of machines working. You also have a pond, which is very important. A pond is a reservoir or a or a supplementary water if you need it. And the sluice is very important as we should see in some of the mills because that helps to turn the wheel. <clears throat> now the River Flurry flows down from Schlieff Gullion, from Schlieff Foy, or from the, the, um, the Cooley Mountains and, and the Fortescue Mountain and Schlieff Gullion. The Flurry River flows down here through, through uh, Flurry Bridge, these are all, this is all the bog area, the bog of bog area of Killeen, Killeen there, Carrie Carnan over here. And this is the Flurry Bridge here. And this is the River Flurry coming through here. <clears throat> and this is the Flurry River here. And, and, and now there are, we will find out that there were six mills, there were six sets of mills on the Flurry River. And we will go through them one by one uh, and see how we get along. Now, the first one, uh, you have the drum ghouls. 
the Tribbles, the Walshes, Horners, Ogles, and uh, Bradford. Now, and this, this, uh, this is interesting as so far as this is the Flurry Bridge. Um, and this is, you have the bleach screens here. And, uh, and the bleach screens that were set up here, they were set up by the Barretts and the Ogles and the Drum Ghouls. And, um, and, and, and these now were converted from basic corn and top mills into very sophisticated uh, linen and bleach mills. And this is Molliard over here. This is the word that was replaced by Ravensdale. Now, just to show you how, how, uh, how sophisticated, so to speak, or, or how uh, improved the basic corn and tuck mills were, that the bleach mills in Molliard, uh, on this occasion, on the first fall of the river, a good lapping room, a drying loft, four acres of turf bog with the premises, lying within the breach screen, the mills, dwelling house, offices, etc. With the house, there were 12 acres. The tenant may be supplied with a large amount uh, also. Let for three lives, the corn mills of Dramad immediately adjoining, with several houses, tenants, Miller, Killenman. The corn mill is in good condition. There were two water wheels, which tried three pairs of stones, two good kilns for drying corn, a flax mill, and a never failing supply of water, being the same which supplies the bleach screen. To this corn mill, eight townlands are bound. So the same conditions were applied to the tenants um, that uh, Malcolm McNeil applied, but they are more loosely applied now because th these guys began making so much money. <clears throat> and these are an example of, of, of the Tribbles mills here. These are the mills in Dramad, Molliard in 1820. The Tribbles mills was taken over by Walsh. Walsh ran a paper mills here. And, and being the first mill on the river meant that he had the clearest water. And Walsh supplied, for many years, he supplied paper to um, Henry Joy around the Belfast uh, newsletter. And he was the leading supplier of paper to, um, uh, to Henry Joy. <clears throat> you have the Ogles down here, and they were very important people because James Fortescue wanted to get big fellows from Newry, rich people from Newry down. And one of the Ogles were the people who he got. And the Ogles were, were uh, actually, they, they, uh, they were, became very good friends of, 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 uh, of Fortescue. Now, what's interesting about this map is that if you were to go to Dramad today, there is no evidence whatsoever of any mill. These have all been obliterated. And they were all obliterated because in 1730s, the landlord came along and he wanted to increase his domain and he closed all these uh, mills down. And Bradford was here at this time. And uh, uh, Bradford said he didn't want to leave, but Fortescue being the head landlord said, you are going to leave. And he gave him a big lot of land out in, uh, in, um, in Cooley or in Jenkinstown, because by this stage, Townley had moved out and Bradford was given an estate in a place called Loch and Moor over uh, in Jenkinstown. <clears throat> the Ogles sold their mill to William Bradford and the only, uh, the only trace of Bradford in, um, in Ravensdale today is on the wall, very close to Arthur Dunn's house up beside Ravensdale Park. And his, his name is written into the wall. I don't know why he went to the trouble of writing his name into the wall. Or maybe this was the gate down to his linen mills back in the day. <clears throat> now, group, group number four involved the Barretts, the Davis, McClellans, and the Thompsons. <clears throat> now, just before we leave Ravensdale Park, uh, I've been talking about the landlords, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. But one particular Fortescue landlord was very bad. And, um, and when, he, when he died, uh, one of the local uh, rhymesters said, uh, here comes the funeral of the cockle lord. For him, the devil gave a great reward. He put wives and orphans out of house and land, and now he is in the home of the damned. It's not a very nice thing to say. 
but at the same time, it just shows that some of the landlords weren't as good as others. Now, <clears throat> the man we're talking about came out of Ravensdale uh, Castle or Ravensdale Park. And in front of Ravensdale Castle, you have a lake. And you can see the lake here on the right hand side. And this lake is important for our purposes because <clears throat> a river ran out of the lake. It was known as the Flurry River. Surprise, surprise. <clears throat> and this river came down here. Okay, on the right hand side, I hope you're following me. But this is the old course of the river. <clears throat> now, Thomas Fortescue, or sorry, James Fortescue realized that if he wanted to um, build mill races, he's going to have to improve the flow of the river. So he changed the course of the river. <clears throat> and he altered the course of the river to this one here. This is, this is a, a, a horizontal view of it. He altered the, the course of the river. Can you see this here? <clears throat> now, and he brought the river down as far as the Curlew Bridge. Okay. And he carried on here to the Curlew Bridge, Curlew Bridge. And he had the race here just south of the Curlew Bridge. Now, whenever he wanted extra water to push the water through into the race, he opened up the sluice on the, on, the, on the lake that he had, and that gave him an additional amount of water to play with. And as a result of that, <clears throat> he was able to create a mill race just south of the Curlew Bridge, which ran, which today runs from the Curlew Bridge down as far as the Ballymascanlan Bridge, which is six kilometers downstream. <clears throat> so this is the beginning of a race for six kilometers. And this is an example of the race. You have the Curlew, you have the River Flurry here, and you have the race here on the left hand side, which is going slightly uphill all the time. That's why it needed water from the lake to propel it. <clears throat> this is the race here coming off the Curlew Bridge. You can see this here. It's going slightly uphill all the time, and then it crashes down here. Okay. Oops. This is, a, this is a photograph of the same thing, slightly down here, and goes right down into this mill and powers these mills here. This is Anna Verna House, and you will notice that there's hardly anybody living in this uh, area down here. There's no houses at all. You will recall how I showed you a map of, um, of, the, uh, the, um, of the, the native virus just uphill from here, living in very, very crowded conditions. Down here in the lowlands, nobody living at all. <clears throat> and Davis's bleach mill here was able to complete 12,000 pieces of linen in a year, a phenomenal amount of linen. Now, this is, this is the, the, the um, photographs of the linen mill uh, in, uh, in Annaverna here. And these two photographs here, I'm very grateful to Nula and Pat O'Rourke who voluntarily gave me these. And they'd say they took those in the late 1960s, early 70s. There's no trace of this big part of the build, building here left anymore. This is the only part of it that's left. But it just gives you some idea of the activity that was going on in those days. And this is the double barrel mill that would have been here in this. I don't know whether you can see that here, right between the two mills. This was the scene of a double barrel mill to show you how important and how uh, busy this mill was. And this is an Averna house, which uh, belonged to the Thompson uh, family, who were one of the, um, the linen people in the, um, in, in the mill. Now, we come along here. We're now moving out of this particular corn mill. And we come down, and the, the race comes down here. You can see the, the race coming out of the center for the um, uh, for the double barrel uh, uh, wheel was. You also have a supplementary tail race here. And this is running down here. A, a, a sluice here is taken, or a, a channel is taken from the River Flurry to supplement this particular uh, flow of the, the, um, the race from here. Every, so every, <clears throat> every trick in the book is being used to keep the water flowing. <clears throat> Now, here we are again, the sluice here 
is encouraging uh, the, the, um, the race to continue. And now we come to an aqueduct. The aqueduct is actually built over, this is the aqueduct here, and it's built over the Anaverna River, which, which comes down here. The Anaverna River is a mountain river, but it would interfere with the flow of the, um, the race, so they built an aqueduct <clears throat> over it. You can see the aqueduct. This is the aqueduct here. And we're now, uh, we now have left the, the third mill and we're now into the, 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 uh, the second mill, we're now into the third group of mills. And these, the people here are the Thompsons and the Johnsons. Okay, and now what we have uh, in Ravensdale House, you have, this is where the Thompsons built the, one of their, the bleachers house. The bleachers were given a linen lease of 15 acres. It was a freehold lease. This is photograph here was taken from the lease that, um, that the Thompsons got. And the ogles got it first of all, but the ogles weren't really that interested in linen. They were bankers really and merchants and they sold it on to the Thompsons. <clears throat> the Thompsons and the ogles of course, were related. This is the example of the linen house that was the home of John Thompson. And this, um, this house is still visible today, as you probably know. <clears throat> and this is, this is uh, the, the same house from a, a picture, uh, from a painting that I got from a cousin of mine, the late Tim Johnson. And this is a, a Thompson's Beetling Mill that we'll come across here. And this was a guard house uh, to keep an eye on the linen. <clears throat> and this is, uh, the, the, this is the bleach screen here. This is where Ravensdale House is. And this is from 1766. And this is the Flurry River here. Unfortunately, the race is not shown on this particular map, but you can see traces of it down here. <clears throat> and here you have, once again, you have the aqueduct up here. You have the race coming down here, and now you have two mills. You have a John, John Thompson mill, and you have an, uh, a Benjamin Thompson mill here. <clears throat> John Thompson's mill is here. Benjamin Thompson's mill is here. These are all linen mills. <clears throat> now you will notice here that Benjamin Thompson's mill here, there was another race coming off this mill, and you will also notice that there was a pond associated with Benjamin Thompson's mill here. The ponds were very important because they were supplementary and kept the water, kept the supply of water in case of emergency. <clears throat> this is the site of John Thompson's mill. <clears throat> and uh, on the right hand side, you have the, 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 the race actually goes under um, the, um, uh, the, the mill and uh, obviously turn the wheel um, in the mill back in the day. And at the front of the house to the left, that's where the Thompsons uh, went to live and lived there for quite a number of time, <clears throat> number of years. John Thompson, as I said, was um, living in that house and he was one of the Ravensdale volunteer, Ballymascanlan volunteers, the Ballymascanlan Rangers. And uh, without going into too much uh, discussion as to who the volunteers were, I just thought it was interesting that this particular Thompson um, uh, this is a, 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 a medal that he got for uh, being part of the Irish volunteers. But it's interesting also that you see here at the very end, <clears throat> it was reported, however, in 1797, that the Ballymascanlan volunteers, who six years ago were all United Irishmen, are now complete orange. <clears throat> now, we'll move on. The second mill of this group um, was a Beatling mill for, by the Thompsons for many, many years. But then it was bought by, by John and by Paul Johnston in 1926, and it was used as a stitching factory. This is a photograph of the workers in the stitching factory. And these are the names of the people, Janet Crilly, Bridget Doherty, maybe some of your, um, some of your aunts or grand aunts uh, were worked in that factory. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, I'm sure there were many stories told uh, of uh, as they cycled their way home to Jonesboro <coughs> or Giles's Key or Linen Hall Street on the dock, 
uh, of their days in the stitching factory. <clears throat> now, we're on to the middle group now, number four, and these are the Thompsons, Lloyd, Benison, Wynne, Johnson, and Atchison. And this is the Scotch mill. Uh, we're now on to this particular, uh, uh, you might remember that the race came from the, um, uh, the, uh, um, the Thompson's mill. It carries on here, turns this beetling mill. This is the beetling mill here. Car you can see it down here to the beetling mill. Then it carries on to a, a Scotch mill and a Scotch mill, this is the Scotch house that worked, was very, um, very difficult work, very tough work and very unhealthy work and very dangerous work. And if you caught your finger in one of those blades, you would be, would be in big trouble. And that's Benison Scotch mill, which was later on converted into a beetling mill. And this is a man beetling here on the right hand side. And then farther down from the beetling mill, you had the bleach and beetling mill. And these are the various activities that go on in the bleaching factory. It wasn't a nice job. It might be romantic looking back on the linen industry, but it was a very difficult job, a very dangerous job, and probably a very unhealthy job. <clears throat> this is bleaching, uh, bleaching and finishing department of the linen. This is spreading out the linen on the green. And this is transporting the linen to market. <clears throat> and linen was lapped rather than rolled. What I mean by that is by having uh, the linen lapped, you were able to see any particular section of the linen that you wanted. You just didn't see the first part. <clears throat> and these are the four mills that we've just been talking about. John Thompson's mill up here, Benjamin Thompson's mill, Penison's bleach green, and then Atchison's and Johnson's bleach green and this is the Bleacher's House, Dulagi Cottage. And this is the closing. The bleach screen then um, was closed in 1957. And this is the, the, the chimney hauling over. Then we're on to group number five, which is the Ogles and the Taylors. And now again, this is the, 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 the race is still going down here. You can see it here. This is a, a pond on the race, again, a supplementary area. This is where the ogles used to live. We're down to bleach green number five here now. And there were, uh, on this particular uh, linen mill, there were lots of watch houses. And the watch houses were there to, to keep, to make sure that the linen disappeared, didn't disappear. And if you were caught stealing linen uh, from uh, a green, you were either, if you, if you were lucky, you were transported if you weren't lucky, you were transported somewhere else. <clears throat> and, this, and this is another, this one up here is another um, watch house in one of the ditches uh, alongside this very, uh, very well hidden. You can probably see it here. Yes, it's tucked over bleach screen over here. This is what it would look like originally, but it was tucked inside very, very carefully in the side of a hedge. <clears throat> uh, and this is an example here of O'Hare's mill that we're down, we're, we're now down to O'Hare's mill. And this is, this is where the pond, the blood, the pond fell, uh, fed this bleach mill. This was the bleach mill here. This is the pond. Th then you have a spade mill. The O'Hare's came along and they built a very important spade mill. And this is a diagram of the spade mill. Uh, this is a, this, this is a wonderful spade mill. Probably the, it was regarded as the finest, as finest example of a spade mill in the country. And, uh, uh, and they, made, they made spades that went all over the country in the 1850s and 1860s. <clears throat> this is a 19th century uh, mill, foundry in operation. This is uh, some of the metals and some of the machinery and some of the utensils that they made. <clears throat> This is the foundry road where the, where the workers uh, were housed to make sure that um, they were uh, being looked after and they were able to keep, uh, um, <clears throat> keep um, <clears throat> themselves close to the work. And that's an example there of a foundry worker on the right hand side. This is an example here of the church, the Catholic church in Ravensdale. And you can see the foundry houses are very, very close to where um, the, the foundry houses are, of course, they're all gone now. 
And just downstream from O'Hare's mill, you had a sawmill, and the sawmill was used to uh, uh, cut uh, spade, uh, handles for the spades. <clears throat> this is the mill race. This is the, 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 the race for the sawmill going in to turn the sawmill wheel. And then the, the race comes out here again and flows all the way down. On to group number six now. This is the last group you'll be pleased to hear. The tipping, a tough mill, the McNeil's a corn mill, Coulter's a corn and linen mill, and the boils. And this particular, this is an interesting picture here, because here you have the Flurry River here on the left-hand side. This is the mill race that is still going about five kilometers from the, the Corio Bridge that we spoke about. And this race goes all the way down to turn a, uh, Tipping's, Tipping's corn mill down here at, at just beside Ballymascanlan Bridge. <clears throat> this is the Tipping's house. Tipping started off as a small house here on the right hand side and gets bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes by. And this is another example of the of the mill race. We have the Flurry River down here and the mill race way, way up here, but just shows the amount of effort and the importance it was to have the water going to the different mill, <clears throat> to the different mills. And then this is Daniel, you, uh, you might remember I mentioned that Daniel, um, or that Malcolm McNeil II had two sons, he had, uh, or Malcolm had two sons. He had Daniel and uh, Malcolm. Well, Daniel uh, was uh, worked as a, made a lot of money in, in, in sugar refinery, but his son, Daniel McNeil, also had great plans to have a big linen complex here in Polique. And he built all these waterways, but um, his uh, estate went into receiver. There was trouble with, he got involved with a cousin of his up in Antrim and the money got short and he had to, he had to, um, <clears throat> he had to forget about making his linen, but it just shows that the efforts they made to generate the water. And they generate, brought the water over here to the Plaster River and the Plaster River goes all the way down to the Ballymascanlan Hotel and it generates a, a, a race that goes under the main, um, this is the main Dundalk Carlingford Road to power this corn mill here. This is, the, this is and, and it too has a mill pond beside it. This is the site of Tucking's, um, tip, uh, Tipping's Tuck Mill here on the right hand side. And then the last slide here is, you might remember we saw this, um, we saw this castle in 1609 in that map of, of the Ulster of Ulster in 1609, and there's a big castle here. And I wonder where that big castle here. Some people say that the village of Ballymascanlan was built out of the stones of the castle. Maybe the corn mill was built out of the stones of the castle. It's hard to know, but Ballymascanlan was there on this map, as you can see, in 1766. <clears throat> So that's the end of it. I think I went too fast towards the end for you, but um, that's the way it goes. I'm told, I'm told my time is up, so I, 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 I better stop. Thank you very much.